Hey guys, welcome back. This is going to be USMLE Step 1 High Yield Images Part 7. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say I noticed that I recently passed over 2,500 subscribers on YouTube, so thank you so, so much to everyone who's been watching my videos and subscribed and commenting. I've been getting a lot of um, very nice compliments recently over the past few weeks, so thank you so much for all of your, all of your support. It really means a lot, and I, I'm really glad that these videos are beneficial for some of you. So this is part seven, let's go ahead and get started. This first image is a, a pretty well-known one, pretty common one, easy board fodder. This is a, an example of a Reed Sternberg cell. So what this is, it's a, a giant B cell, so it's important to know that it's a B cell, um, and it has a bilobed nucleus, as you can see here, with prominent inclusion. So these are the two nuclei, one, two, and very prominent uh, dark inclusions in there. And this Reed Sternberg cell is seen in Hodgkin lymphoma. Very high yield. Everything about this image and this cell, it's a B cell, bilobe nucleus with prominent inclusions, and it is seen in Hodgkin lymphoma. This next image is an example of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals, and these are commonly seen in pseudo gout. So the classic description of these is positively biofringent and rhomboid or coffin shaped. So here's a good example of one here, kind of rhomboid shaped, coffin shaped, maybe you can hallucinate that. So these crystals, again, positively biofringent, rhomboid or coffin shaped, and they're seen in gout. This next one is an example of Rosenthal fibers. So these are clumped intermediate filaments that you can see all over here, all over here. Um, and they're found in astrocyte processes. They are, they are GFAP positive. I believe that stands for glial fibrillarily associated or astrocyte protein. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the important thing to know is that they're seen in pilocytic astrocytoma. So these Rosenthal fibers know what they are. They're intermediate filaments that are clumped together. And they're seen in pilocytic astrocytoma. This next image is an example of the membranous nephropathy, and the classic description here is the spike and dome appearance. As you can see, good example of it right here. So the spike and dome appearance is referring to the glomerular basement membrane, and the reason that it has this kind of appearance, spike and dome, is because immune complexes are being deposited into the basement mem membrane, which is thickened in this condition in, mem in membranous nephropathy. So uh, the glomerular nephropathies are all high yield, uh, and maybe I'll make a video in the future describing all the different findings associated with those because they are really easy to get mixed up. But in this case, spike and dome appearance on the image, you want to think about membranous nephropathy. This next image is an example of fatty casts, also called oval fat bodies. Um, probably not something that you're going to see an image of on the exam, a little bit lower yield in terms of the pictures that I show, but it, it is still something important to know and it is seen in nephrotic syndrome due to lipiduria. So patients that have nephrotic syndrome are also excreting lipids in the urine. So if you were to take a look, you might see these fatty casts. This next image is an example of central retinal vein occlusion. Um, really important to know the difference between central retinal artery and central retinal vein. In terms of the description in the vignette, they're gonna sound pretty similar. It's going to be a sudden painless monocular vision loss with central retinal artery or central retinal vein occlusion. So that's going to be pretty much the same. The way that you're going to be able to differentiate it is going to be by the fundoscopic exam. In this case, central retinal vein occlusion, we're going to see retinal hemorrhages, which we see right here, nice hemorrhage, um, as well as venous engorgement. Some of these veins, as compared to a regular fundoscopic exam, are a little bit thick and a little bit engorged. And the classic description, uh, which you won't see, but it's good to know, is the blood and thunder appearance. So that's what you're talking about right here with central retinal vein occlusion. This next image is another cast, and it's an example of a red blood cell cast um, seen in acute glomerulonephritis, which is pretty commonly known. But the other thing that's not as commonly known is that these red blood cell casts are seen in malignant hypertension. So if you see an image like this, again, maybe a little lower yield. I never really saw images of casts when I was doing questions or on the boards. Um, but if you do see one, it's an example of a red blood cell cast here, seen in acute glomerulonephritis as well as malignant hypertension. This next image, the arrows are pointing to smudge cells, or what they call, and the condition associated with that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. 
Uh, according to Pathoma, the way that he likes to go about it is CLL stands for crushed little lymphocytes. And it looks like somebody kind of put their thumb and just kind of smudge these or crush these. So just know how it looks. Make the association of smudge cells with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This next image is an example of some good micro. It's a blastomyces. And the way that this is going to be described, if it's in a vignette, is going to be a broad-based budding dimorphic fungus. Let me say that again. Blastomyces is broad-based budding dimorphic fungus. So a lot of bees associated with that. Uh, and another important fact to know about blastomyces is that these are about the same size as red blood cells. So a lot of these fungi, when they take pictures of them and put them on the exam or they describe them, they might throw in that it's smaller than a red blood cell or bigger or the same size. If you hear that it's about the same size as a red blood cell, you want to be thinking of blastomyces. This next image, uh, more glomerulonephropathies. This is an example of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And the classic description associated with this is the tram track appearance, which you can see really well right here where this arrow is pointing a little bit over here um, and, and some other areas. But I think this is the most prominent area. Uh, and this is seen... Uh, it's the basement membrane that we're talking about has that tram track appearance seen under light microscopy. So again, the glomerulonephropathies are, are very high yield, the descriptions and how they look on light microscopy as well as electron microscopy. This next one is an example of candida albicans, and this is how it exists at a body temperature. It's seen as germ tubes, which are true hyphae. Uh, so just take a look at this. No, obviously candida albicans exists in different forms, different temperatures. So in this case, body temperature is going to exist as germ tubes. This next example is an example of aspergillus. And this structure here, what it is called is a conidiophore. So this is a conidiophore. And if you see this flower-like appearance, you want to associate that with aspergillus. Don't get this confused with the spaghetti and meatballs appearance of Malassezia furfur. It is different. Uh, be sure to take a look at that picture and be able to differentiate them. It's not the same thing. This next example, the yellow arrow, is pointing to a keratin pearl. So what this is is concentric layers, which you can see here, kind of like an onion, concentric layers of squamous cells, which are commonly seen in various squamous cell, squamous cell carcinomas. So pretty self-explanatory. These are constant... Um, round layers of keratin cells, of squamous cells, and it's seen in various squamous cell carcinomas, so keratin pearl. This next one is an example of uric acid crystals. Uh, these are one of the various nephrolithiasis crystals that they might show or describe on the exam, and the, um, the description for this is rhomboid. And just like the one of the first pictures that I showed, another example of rhomboid is going to be those calcium um, crystals that are associated with pseudogout, so be sure that you are able to differentiate those based on the image or based on the description that they're giving you. This next one uh, is an example of a signet ring cell. So I actually saw this several times uh, in board questions. Uh, so it's, I, I would say it's a little bit higher yield. Um, but the signet ring cell right here is commonly seen in diffuse type gastric carcinoma. So signet ring cells, diffuse type gastric carcinoma. And the reason that it has this appearance is because this white area within the cell, this is a lot of mucin production, overproduction, which pushes the nucleus to the periphery. So people say it looks kind of like a diamond ring, thus the name signet ring cells. Um, here's one, maybe another example of one here, one here. So this white part isn't empty, it's filled with mucin, which is pushing the nucleus to the periphery. Signet ring cells, diffuse type uh, gastric carcinoma. This next image is an example of councilman bodies. So these are eosinophilic globules, very pink as we can see. Eosinophilic globules of cell that represents dying hepatocytes surrounded by normal parenchyma. So let me say that again. These councilman bodies right here, eosinophilic globules of cells that represent dying hepatocytes surrounded by normal parenchyma. So what we're seeing here, these are dying hepatocytes due to liver damage. This next image is an example of a waxy cast, our third cast of the video. Uh, again, uh, a little less high yield than some of the other images that I'm showing, but I still think it's important to be ex exposed to it. So this waxy cast, kind of a crumpled, torn little piece of paper it looks like, is seen commonly in end-stage renal disease. 
So be sure to differentiate all these casts that we're seeing, the fatty casts um, and nephrotic syndrome, red blood cell casts and acute glomerulonephritis, as well as malignant hypertension, and then the waxy cast in end-stage renal disease. This next example is the histology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and, you know, this is a little bit difficult. They would have to give you some information about a young athlete or sudden death or something like that um, along with this picture. But um, these myofibers are in extreme disarray. If you look up on Google an example of the myofibers of the heart and how they're arranged, they're really linear, nicely, well-arranged, branching, that kind of thing. Uh, in this case, with, with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the disorganized septum, the thickened septum, it's, it's very disorganized and there's really no um, distinct pattern like you would normally expect to see in the cardiac cells. Uh, this is an example of an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So this usually occurs due to systemic hypertension. And it, uh, it's also important to know where it occurs in the brain usually. And it usually occurs in the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Um, so be sure to know this image. I know a lot of medical students are used to identifying a subdural or an epidural hematoma. Those are pretty easy. And then they see something like this and they think it might be a mass. Don't be tripped up. There's no midline shift here, as you can see. It is an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. I believe this is the last image uh, for this video. This is an example of central pontine myelinolysis, also known as osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is what we're seeing here on a brain MRI. Remember, this condition occurs due to rapid correction of hyponatremia. And, and really, the, the main thing that we're looking at here is this, this bright enhancement of the pontine white matter. If they give you an MRI of this, it is not supposed to be this enhanced. Um, they'll probably give you some, some information along with this. But if you see this image of the MRI and this is just absolutely lit up, you want to be thinking about central pontine myelinolysis, also called osmotic demyelination syndrome. All right, so that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, please be sure to subscribe, leave your comments and your suggestions. Thank you so much for all of the positive feedback that I've gotten so 